Yvonne Heath, married to best friend Jordi, a mother of three, Yvonne is loving life in beautiful Muskoka, Ontario, and she is on a mission. In 27 years of nursing, she witnessed our society's death phobia and how our reluctance to talk about, plan, prepare for grief, death and dying causes excessive suffering in life and at the end of life. She suffered too, not knowing how to do it differently. At age 50, she left her career and blazed a new trail. Her new purpose? to empower compassion, compassionate communities and professionals to live life to the fullest, learn to grieve and support others, and to have the talk about the end of life long before it arrives and diffuse the fear. Yvonne shares her message with heart and humor as an inspirational speaker with her work entitled, Love Your Life to Death. As a television and radio host and through social media, she loves helping nonprofit organizations along the way. She has also created the I Just Showed Up movement, teaching people of all ages to show up for themselves and others. So they are empowered and resilient when grief arrives. Together, we can create a culture of change. And I welcome you on to the stage. really don't know what to do and I don't know what to say this is pretty uncomfortable it's pretty awkward just raise your hand if you've ever said these things or felt this way when someone was grieving facing a crisis in life or just a challenge anybody anybody else who didn't raise their hand <laughs> I can tell you that I felt that way in nursing more times than I can count and in my personal life but because I was a healthcare professional, I felt that I should know the answers, and I should know what to say, and I should know what to do. The problem is, is that none of us really did, and we didn't talk about it. And we didn't say, I don't know what to say, do you? No, we all just kind of pretended that we did. So I was very good at suffering excessively. And I took care of people who were suffering and grieving, and age, race, cultural differences, ability, disability, chronic disease, and I knew that I wanted to help them, and I wanted to make a difference. And there were so many times I felt like I couldn't. And so again, I suffered excessively. But I was, you don't know this yet, but I am pretty funny. I know Peter was I'm like, darn it, he took, he's like, he's really funny, I enjoyed him. But in my nursing career, I, I was compassionate and I could make people laugh because there are many times that I went to work actually, like in the chemotherapy clinic, because it's already serious enough and it's Halloween, so I thought, okay, well, I'll dress up. It's Halloween, everyone will be dressed up. And I'd arrive and I'd be the only one dressed up in the entire hospital. So I thought, you know what, I'll just start dressing up randomly because it's already serious enough. And so I want to make people laugh. But I was suffering and I thought, I need to be a voice for change. I need to do something different. I don't know what to do. And I'd say to social workers and doctors and nurses, I'd say, are we well prepared, personally and professionally, for grief, death, and dying? And they'd say, God, no, we suck at it. And they'd say, well, then who is teaching professionals? Or who is teaching other professionals? And who is teaching community? Who is helping our patients and their, and their families through this? And they'd all say, I have no idea. Just do your job. We don't want to talk about this. We're too busy to think about this. But I needed to do something. So I started at age 49. And this is where you turn to the person beside you and say, oh my gosh, she doesn't even look for me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Okay. Thanks. Anyway. So I need to do something different. I don't know. I, I've got to be a voice for change. And my dear supportive husband, I'd say, I don't know. I need to do something. And I was sitting at my computer, and like many of us have a life-changing moment. There was a pop-up on Facebook. How to write a best-selling book. I went, oh my god. I'm going to leave my 27-year nursing career to write a book. Honey, isn't that amazing? And he's like, yeah, honey, that's great. Like, please don't leave your job. Please don't leave your job. We have three children and a mortgage. And he's like, yeah, that's great, honey, but you know, you, you haven't even journaled or you don't write. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're trying to be supportive, but sort of underlying begging not to change. But I said, 
I have to do something. And it was like I became the cookie author in the forest. I was writing at 4.30 in the morning. My eyes bugged out. And the kids would get up and need breakfast. I'd say, Mother's writing. Go get some cereal. I don't care what you make for your lunch. I was just, I don't know, I was just kidnapped by passion. And I even reached out when I was doing this. I reached out to Patch Adams. Does anybody know who Patch Adams is? Who doesn't love Patch Adams? So for those of you who don't know, he is a doctor who brings joy to people who are grieving, suffering, living with illness. He puts on his red nose. And there was a, a movie that uh, Robin Williams starred in, Robin Who Lives Forever in My Heart. And uh, the movie was entitled Patch, and I fell in love with that movie. And he was my inspiration with all my zany outfits at work. Patch Adams was, but we called the office. My husband's like, oh, Jordy's like, well, why don't we just call and see if you know he'll give you a quote for his book? I said, why not? So a lesson: if you want something, just ask. Sometimes it happens. Hello, my name's Yvonne Heath. Uh, the Guzan Type Institute. Uh, I really love Patch Adams. He's been my mentor from afar forever. I'm writing this book. I love a quote from Patch. He said, well, he's just on his way to Peru, but I think he's still in the office. Uh, would you mind holding for a minute? <laughs> um, yes, I'll hold. Will you talk to Patch Adams? Yes, yes, I'm holding. Oh, my God, he's talking to Patch Adams. Right? Yes, I'm still holding. Yeah. And uh, he talked to Patch Adams, and Patch said, thank you so much for writing this book. And his quote was, if you got to die, why not make it fun? And I thought, wow, can we really get to that place? I don't know. But I sent out one email and I asked people, I said, I do not want surveys and statistics in my book. I want real stories of being in the deep trenches of grief, finding joy on the other side. Because I, I so many chemotherapy patients I saw that lived well and died well and their families were able to move through their grief while others stayed stuck. And I wanted to know how. How do you find joy again after such deep grief? And I sent out one email and I said, will anyone share their stories with me? Well, four years later, the stories haven't stopped coming. And in my book, I interview, I don't know if you can tell I'm excited that I actually pulled it off. I was pretty excited. And um, I, uh, I even had Lloyd Robertson, people know the, can the Canadians, but Lloyd Robertson, he's cool. He's like your, the US people, Walter Cronkite or something. But, he loved my message, and I interviewed people ages 11 to 101, and I was able to share their stories, and it changed my life. And it became, who knew? You can have a surprising life. Believe me, I was a nurse for 27 years. People would have told me I'd be interviewing people and sharing their stories on TV and radio and in my book. I would have said, I'm sorry, you're confused with someone else. But what I realized is sharing our stories is what heals ourselves and other people. And everyone has a story, and there are so many incredible stories here. And uh, when we share our stories and gather, that's how we can get through with connection. And so I truly honor you for being here. And this isn't an easy journey, is it? I know it isn't. And I know that I don't know what it's like to have Huntington's. But I do know what it's like to be a nurse, taking care of a beautiful woman my age with Huntington's, and to feel helpless. As I watched her suffer and I watched her demise, I suffered excessively. I don't know what it's like to have a relative diagnosed with Huntington's, but I know what it's like to have a niece who's diagnosed with a life-threatening heart condition and to feel desperately that I wanted to support her and my sister and their family, but they lived thousands of miles away and I knew I couldn't fix it. And I don't know what it's like to have a child with a life-threatening illness, but I do know what it's like to watch my son's life spiral out of control with drugs, alcohol, and addiction. And I know what it's like to have to fight for his life. I know what it's like to be divorced, to be a single parent, be broke, to be broken, unemployed, and to feel alone and isolated and avoided at my darkest time. I don't know if anyone can relate to that. I know what it's like to pretend I'm okay when I'm not. I've known grief. But most of all, I know what it's like to care deeply and to want to know what it's like for someone else and to be willing to sit with them on their hardest day. I don't know everything, but this much I know. So I am committed to creating a culture of change where we talk about grief before grief arrives. 
And people even sometimes when they see the title of my book, Love Your Life to Death, said, I want to read that. I don't want to hear what you have to say. And I say, you're why I had a book to write. <laughs> because grief is a part of this journey. And it is the one thing that we don't prepare for. We don't talk about grief until we're in crisis, right? We, we wait until we're suffering, and then we think, oh my goodness, what do I do with this? People say to me, why should I prepare for grief before grief arrives? I promise you this is the hard stuff, and it will get lighter. But why should we? Because grief shows no mercy. It arrives unannounced and uninvited. It does not care what else you are going through. And it does not care if you've had enough. It can be relentless, and it can destroy relationships, it can destroy success, and it can destroy you. And grief is coming. Is this time you're saying, like, sorry, I thought she was inspirational, this is real awful, like, who, who booked this speaker? This is terrible. Have you ever been in a moment where someone is having the greatest moment of their life and someone else is having the hardest time? Someone is getting divorced? Someone is getting married. Someone is having a baby and someone is burying a loved one. I've been in this situation so many times and what a roller coaster it is to navigate. How can you be present for people and be joyful and the next minute you're over here trying to support someone who's grieving? I was at the funeral of a doctor who was younger than I was, you know, because I'm 53. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and I was at the back, and you know, there were so many grieving people. I think there were like 500 people there, and his best friend burst in the door. And he, I was at the back, and he was standing right beside me. He's like, Oh my God, I'm sorry I'm late. I was, I was just delivering a baby. He was just delivering a baby, and there he was for his, there for the celebration of life for his friend. And then Jordy and I had to go home after this celebration, and we had our twins' birthday party. It was all in the same day. You know, how do you navigate through that? So I say, you know, let's get ready for grief. Because it is a part of this journey. It doesn't have to destroy us. And the truth is, when people, it's so funny, so many people, oh, you're talking about grief, are you talking to the seniors? Well, yes, I'm happy to talk to the seniors. But I'm also going to speak to the children, and the teens, and the young adults. Because I don't know if you've heard, but grief is a part of this journey, and it isn't just about end of life. Grief is whatever makes your heart ache. Divorce, diagnosis, job loss, mental health issues, children leaving home, children not leaving home. <laughs> oh my god, I get a job. Oh. Our dear Tyler, who brought us on that wonderful journey, uh, who's doing much better and ironically lives in Kelowna. I remember one morning he was, I don't know, whatever, 19 or something, and you know, it's like, so, you're going to be looking for a job? And you know, he had to sleep in and stuff. He was very busy. <laughs> he was in the basement and he texted me. It was like 2.30 in the afternoon. He was just, hey, mom, just, uh, just getting up. Do you think you could bring me a glass of orange juice? <laughs> <laughs> no, I cannot get out. <laughs> so here's the good news. Although grief is a part of living and loving, it is worth it, and our hearts will heal. I promise you, battered, scarred, and never the same, but our hearts can heal if we learn to take better care of ourselves and each other, if we talk about plan and prepare for grief. And so in my journey of 27 years of nursing and the last four years of interviewing hundreds of people, I've come up with these takeaways and I believe these principles are so critical for living well, grieving well, and planning for end of life. Because it's all just a part of this journey, isn't it? So everybody's comfortable, right? I'm going to just get a little drink of water because there are 90 takeaways. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thanks so much for allowing me to say that. Some people like, oh my god, how long does she have? <laughs> I have seven takeaways. And actually, when you sign up for to watch my weekly vlog, you get the takeaways described, so you should do that too. So let's get through the hardest one. Takeaway number one. The best time to talk about plan and prepare for grief is when we are young and healthy. 
So maybe some of us have missed that boat. When is the next best time? The next best time is now. Oh my goodness, we are so wonderful at procrastinating, aren't we? And I love when people say to me, and someone said it yesterday, um, oh, well, why should I do that? I'm only in my 40s. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I hate to be the one to tell you, we don't all die of old age. I'm so sorry you didn't know that. And we don't always get a warning, do we? You know, whether you have an illness, a diagnosis, I could die before everybody here, and I'll be really mad if it's, but you know, I'm here as long as I'm here. I don't know how long that is. I don't know how long that is, and I accept that. And we know in these conversations, don't wait till you're ready to have them. Who says, you know, it's Saturday morning, the sun is shining, I think this is a great day to do our end of life planning and have all these conversations. That never happens. The best time to talk about planning and repair is now. Not because you have a diagnosis, not because you're a certain age, because you're living. And end of life is a part of this journey, and it is always the elephant. The elephant is always in the room. Am I right? Grant, is the elephant always in the room? Yes. I mean, look. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the elephant is always in the room. I don't know because I bring them with me. So here is the critical piece, that in 27 years of nursing and being in chemotherapy for 14 years, I sure wish that everybody lived by this. End of life decisions should not be made at end of life. Do you know what I'd like to see? I, this is my big goal, is that at 18, we just, we turn, become adults and we just, we can, we can normalize anything, right? Normalize anything, because what, what would, some of you have been doing in this room 30 years ago that right now there's no way you could do and i know some of you would know the answer what's something that used to be normal oh yeah the smokers always know the answer right <laughs> <laughs> like you could be at a health conference people are smoking the doctor there used to be ashtrays at the nurse's station at the hospital we all smoked hey you pass me a light give a light give a cigarette let's have one of the smokers light up in here and see what happens <laughs> Marbles when they like we oh, what are you doing? Are you kidding? We can normalize anything. What I would like to normalize is that at 18 years old you go and you get your health card and you do your oh Mr. Jo or Joe. I know I always pick on Joe, sorry if there's a Joe here. Joe, I see you know you've done your end of life plan, tick tick tick, there's a checklist. Are you an organ donor? Yes, make that decision or not, whatever, but you're registered, okay, and we just normalize. Not because you have a diagnosis to your certain age, you just normalize it, right? So then Joe, a couple of years later, well, like, oh, Joe, I see you're married now. Yes, my wife, she's the beneficiary, power of attorney, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, look at your own province, everybody has different things, but now I'm married, let me add my wife. A couple of years later, you have children, let's add the, my children, like, let's just normalize this flow and update it throughout life. A couple of years later, you're get the wife off the pill, but yeah, sorry, I'm just to be honest. Imagine what that would do to our society and the suffering that we could alleviate if we just normalized end-of-life planning, not because we have a diagnosis or because we're a certain age. It would change everything, and in fact, it would probably save our healthcare system. How do I know? Because I cannot tell you how many chemotherapy patients would say, take me to the side and say, I really don't want this blood transfusion, I don't want this chemo or this surgery, and I'd say, I would beg, and I'd say, please talk to your family, let them know how you feel, and they'd say, no, they're not ready for me to give up. If we normalize these conversations throughout life, we wouldn't have to have those awkward conversations at that time. Look, they're walking across stage, so, <laughs> it's me walking across stage. So many healthcare professionals are telling people to do advanced care planning, and I say, well, have you done it? I say, well, no, I haven't done it. I mean, my job is to tell other people to do it. I say, you know, here's the thing. <laughs> That's kind of hypocritical, isn't it? I say, I definitely, I think it's each and every one of our responsibility to plan our life and end of life, but certainly if you're instructing other people to do it. So I had to walk my talk, and you know, I dug into my soul, and I, I had done some end of life planning, but I really crossed my T's and dotted my I's and I dig into my I dug into my heart and soul and wrote letters for our three children. And I hope they get a stack of letters because I really want to be here for a long time. But you know, I'm just doing this along the way and I update. There was even a time I, you know, said I wanted to be cremated and I loved where we lived. We had a beautiful yard and a ski hill and I said 
spread my ashes in our yard and the ski hill, that's wonderful. And good thing about update because they say, well, hang on, we don't live there anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm done. Spray my ashes there, that'd be really creepy for the people that live there now. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we can have banter because we have these conversations. Jordy's parents, his dad's like, I want to full on and everything. Like, I want to parade down Main Street and everything. And, you know, if I'm in this place, you better pull the plug. And we're like, Peter, don't worry about that. We're going to have to draw straws about who gets to. <laughs> They're kind of grumpy, but anyways, God, oh, this is on Facebook. I didn't say that. And then, you know, his mom is like, I don't want anything. And I have a little friend who was saying that yesterday. I don't want anything, you know. And then we often read at end of life, somebody who has died and cremation is taking place and nothing, nothing is, uh, they're not having a celebration of life or anything. But, you know, here's the thing, and I did write about this because the truth is, is that funerals and celebrations of life are just as much for the living and the grieving, aren't they? And it is so critical have that support in your sad, dark time and to hear the wonderful stories and to, to just gather, to, to, to be sad together, to laugh together, to cry together. It doesn't have to be any grand thing, but I think it is so important. And I hope that you do too, and if you don't, let's chat some more. So I did my end of life plan, and I said, yeah, I want a great, let's have a celebration, please. Everybody say how funny I was and uh, that I was so wonderful and Let's not talk about all my flaws. But I said, you know, I want, I took this a step further and I said, I know this stuff is not, this isn't me telling you that this is easy. This is hard for me too. And that's why I'm embracing this. So I said to my husband, Jordy, you know, if I'm gonna tell people that they need to do their end of life planning and do it with their families, I wanna be a great example. So you need to do it too. Like I need you to do your end of life plan. Of course, procrastination. Yeah, yeah, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. <laughs> Well, finally he came to me and he said, you know what? I did my end of life plan, I'm pretty proud of myself. I said, oh, wow, you did, really, that's great. Yep, I'm registered as an Oregon donor because that's what we've chosen. And so I never have to make that decision, right? I didn't want to have to make that decision in my family. Actually, I'll sidestep and I called my son who lives in Cologne. I said, this is how you start an awkward conversation, by the way. Let's, let's just keep it simple, people. Hi, Ty, awkward conversation coming up. <laughs> that's how I started, isn't that brilliant? Yeah, I just want to talk to you about organ donation because I, if I ever have to make that decision, I don't want to have to make it, right? I don't want to have to make that decision. He's like, well, Mom, I never just sit here having a beer with my friends and never thought of that. And I said, yeah, I get it. So, but this is why I'm passionate about it. You know, I've met thousands of people who are alive because of organ donation. I'm very passionate about it. And, and so I want you to make a decision. And he said, well, I guess that'd be pretty much a waste if we didn't, right? But I guess they probably could use my liver, ha ha. And I'm like, oh my god, that was hilarious. <laughs> so maybe they could use it for research. <laughs> so, you know, so whatever. So he has done that. And I never have to think about that again. So back to Jordy with his wishes done. I, and I, you know, Facing my mortality or someone, the people, mortality of the people I love is hard. It's hard. I got emotional and I got very emotional thinking that. I said, well, can I, I, I'd like to read them because if there's anything we need to talk about and sort out, let's do it now before grief arrives. So I sat there and I started reading and I was like, it was so weird. I had like this deja vu and I'm reading and I just thought, it's so weird to have this deja vu. Um, so actually. <laughs> It wasn't a deja vu, and this is a true story. Um, Jordy took my wishes, and he put in his name. He put in he's for she's, him's for hers, and said, hey, I've done my end of life wishes. And I said, are you joking right now? Like, you plagiarized my end of life wishes? I said, I dug into my heart and soul to write this, and everything's like, yeah, you did a really good job. <laughs> so, okay. Well, we'll see what happens if you go first. <laughs> so we've done this, and I will come, I tell you, this is the most empowering thing that I have done. And if someone said it yesterday as well, what a great gift to our family. Because grief is hard enough. Grief is enough to go through. Let's get rid of all this other stuff so people aren't trying to crack codes and there aren't fractured families beyond repair. And this young girl that shared, her brother will not speak anymore because they all had different wishes or thoughts about mom's end of life. We, this is the excessive suffering we cause ourselves. 
let's eliminate that because grief is enough. So we even went, I said to my mom, okay, mom, you know, you, my mom's on her own. And I said, you know, once again, awkward conversation coming up. I want to talk to you about your end of life planning because it, when that time comes, whether it's me or you, you know, we all need to have this. Done ahead of time, she said, yes, I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about it. You wrote your book. I, I've been thinking about it. And actually, um, I've written down little messages for everybody. I want all the kids to have trinkets and you and everything. And, and I'm going to give you this picture. It wasn't actually that picture. It's, but I hated that picture. I just hated it. It was so ugly. So I said, oh, Mom. Um, maybe you should give that one to Rachel, my sister. <laughs> yeah, I think she'd like that. So, phew, fantastic. She said, oh, no problem. So she raised that and put Rachel's name and I don't, you know. So we got all kinds of things sorted out. There were so many things that we had to discuss. And now it's done and we laughed and we cried and we went to the funeral home and we they said, did we just have a fun day doing your end of life plan? I said, yes, because we felt so much more connected. So we've done this. Mine check, Jordy's check, my mom's check. And here's the other tough one. Quality of life, quantity of life. These are not conversations people have until they're facing it. And I have been in the intensive care when people are hooked up to machines and people are, are fighting about what should be done and what should, has anybody ever been part of those stories? What should be done? We've had to call security on families because they got so out of control. Isn't that awful? at a time where they should be supporting each other, right? So we've had conversations about end of life, quality of life, quantity of life, and if a cure is not possible for me, I don't care what my age is. I've lived a full life, once again, 53. <laughs> and however much longer I'm here, how wonderful, but don't keep me living because I'm only this age. Let's have these conversations, and if the best thing to do is go to that park, then that's where I want to be. So let's talk about that. So that's takeaway number one. The hardest, the most important. Now takeaway number two. It's so funny because in so many situations people are grieving and someone has a chronic illness or in the dying process, it isn't just a short amount of time. This audience knows that only too well. So many times people think, oh, we need the professionals, right? Oh, they've got the professionals, the grief counselors and the nurses, and how wonderful that we do need the professionals part of the time. I say the professionals are like the blue people in there. Because the truth is, to live well and grieve well and plan for end of life and live life to the fullest, we need our community. We need our village, right? The whole, oh, I can do this on my own, well, that just doesn't work in so many situations. And professionals need their communities too. I needed my community. I need my community for things we're going through with my son, and everyone avoided me like the plague. No one asked me anything about how we were doing. And my life was falling apart, actually, and I put on that happy face. I just needed, I didn't need a professional, I just needed someone to care. I needed my neighbors, my friends, my family, my coworkers to just ask how I was doing. Because the truth is, it takes a village. And 10% of the time, Pallium Canada, who wants to ensure that, uh, that we all have great palliative care across Canada, so we need professionals, maybe 10% of the time, sometimes in a crisis more, but you think about it, there's 24 hours in a day. We can't have a social worker and a doctor and a nurse with us 24 hours a day. We need our community because it takes a village. It takes a village to support the ill, the caregiving, the caregiver, the dying, the bereaved, and each other. And we need to get back to being okay with saying that, yep, I need help. I've seen so many people that just feel like they, they get a badge of honor for not asking for help. And the truth, I've done it. I've done it. I have twins, and we have family, and I'm like, I can stay up till two in the morning and get up with my twins. I am super mom. And I ended up in the hospital. <laughs> Why do we do that to ourselves? I think it shows so much more strength to say, I need my village. Ever had someone say that and look at you, right? <laughs> the big eyes when you say something, or where's Sharon? She's so darn cute. Sharon was saying when when she's somewhere and you know, she says, Well, I know Huntington's. <laughs> wow, you can make people look like that. 
that really quickly, like, oh God, I don't know what to do or say. This is so uncomfortable. I said to her, so I said, what would be a great thing to say? Oh, tell me about that. That sounds hard. Tell me about that. When we, you know, we, we complicate it, right? We think we need to have a PhD to just care. I was saying, I don't know what to say, but I, I'm here to listen. I, I'd love to listen. And you know what? Let's let people off the hook. Let's just tell them what you'd like to hear because they're so afraid to do or say the wrong thing, so they avoid. How about, I have Huntington's. You know what a great thing to say would be? <laughs> Ask me what that's like. Because if someone would have said that to me when we were going through our horrible time, I would have really loved to just say my story and then move forward as opposed to them avoiding me and me pretending I was fine. And everyone looking like that. You know, I made it my job also. I just kind of stepped back. If I'm going to talk to people about grief and preparing for grief, what does grief look like? What is grief? And, and the stages, you know, people have heard of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Right? She's the pioneer of study of grief, death, and dying. And she talked about stages of grief, you know, first of denial and, and denial and numbness. And then there's anger, because anger is a very overlooked part of grief. Fear, panic, loneliness, depression, and then finally sometimes acceptance. And people call me all the time, so, you know, I've been grieving this thing for like four months. I should be through the stages. Why aren't I done yet? But don't we wish it worked like that? So I don't know about you all. When I'm grieving, I kind of look like that. I am a disaster. Isn't grief more like this, right? Sometimes, you know, I think about it all together, I'm doing well, and all of a sudden, oh, what just happened? I just fell apart in a million pieces right now. Because that's what's, what grief is like. And we can, be, we can have a grief attack four years later. We, and, and if you're at work or somewhere, just say, I'm really having a hard time right now. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that village could just be there for you? Say, I know I can't fix this, but I can listen. Because that is what grief is like. And I do not apologize for falling apart. And actually, sometimes when people see me in the grocery store talking to anybody, it's like, oh my god, there's a bunch who can make someone cry because she's going to make them tell the truth about how they're doing. Right? This is grief. And this is life. It's a roller coaster. And if you don't remember anything else I say today, people say, well, how can we make this easier? And I do. I have, people say, there's no magic answer. Yes, I have the magic answer. When you don't know what to do, and you don't know what to say, and it's awkward, and it's uncomfortable, you can't fix it, we can teach people the magic answer. Three words. Just show up. Am I right? Just show up. What does just showing up mean? It's not grand gestures. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. The smallest, wonderful gestures of kindness make all the difference, don't they? Hug, text, email, call, listen, sit silently, cry together. People say, what if I make them cry? Say, so we'll get them a tissue. What if I cry? Well, get yourself a tissue. <laughs> My God. Allow your humanness, right? It's okay. You won't break, I promise. You will not break. Are there any ways you can just shout out a couple of things that people have showed up, just shown up for you that made a difference, that didn't cost a lot of money or didn't take, wasn't a grand gesture? Anybody? Shoveled our snow. Shoveled your snow. You live in my neighborhood. Yes. <laughs> Shovel your snow, because when you're in grief or crisis, the daily activities of life continue, don't they? And maybe you don't feel like doing that. Oh my goodness, any time, please shovel my snow when I'm having a hard time. Yes. Watching your cat while you're here. Yes. I mean, these are the things that make a difference. Yes. Oh my God, clean <laughs> my house. Thank you. Let me just tell you, yes. Like, just come and clean the house and shovel the walkway and do, like, come on, watch the cat do all these things. Just show up. We don't always need a professional, and these are the things that make us feel so supported in our grief, in our whole time. And we need to be okay with saying, absolutely, here's all the things you can do. 
And you know, part of just showing up is acknowledging and allowing all feelings. My goodness, our poor people are so compassionate. They're just so frightened to do or say the wrong thing. Say, acknowledge and allow all feelings, yours and someone else's. Don't minimize, oh, well, you know, at least you have this or that, or no, don't minimize. My brilliant words often say, oh my goodness, this sucks, and I start to cry. I, I'm not trying to silver lining it, sugarcoat, just, and I'm not trying to fix it. And for my goodness, how many people, when you, someone, when you tell your story, also let them know, and please don't answer my story with your story. Right? Do people do that? You tell them a story? It's like, oh my god, my Aunt Betsy had that, and she was, I, I was praying with twins. Oh my friend, my gosh, she was praying with twins, and her legs blew up like elephants, and she was on bed rest for eight months. Is that helpful? I didn't feel like that was a very helpful story. I, I'm sorry. People love to tell, answer the stories. But she said, I'm just going to tell you my story. I just need to listen. I don't need you to fix it. And I'm probably going to cry. And I don't hear your story right now. You can tell me another time. Oh, here's another one. Forget the golden rule. And people say, oh my goodness, we all live by the golden rule. What are you talking about? Well, here's the thing that I learned when I'm grieving. I am a hugger. I will just glomp on you. And I met someone who was grieving, and I said, oh my goodness, they're grieving. They must need a hug. Have you ever tried to hug a non-hugger? <laughs> <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> this woman, and we know who, you know who she is. I just, oh my gosh, you're having a hard time. I'm just like, just, don't touch me. I don't like to be touched. And I went, wow. How presumptuous of me to think she's grieving, so she must need a hug, right? Because that's what I, well, oh, you're grieving, you must need a hug. Oh, right. So I just now realize that we need to forget the golden rule, not treat people the way we want to be treated, treat people the way they want to be treated. Isn't that so much better and makes so much more sense? And here's the other thing, people, ask, right? Again, we don't have to know the answers, let's just ask. Looks like you're having a hard time. I want to give you hugs, is that right? Nope. Okay, so just pop up every name. Okay, I'm here. Just ask. And many times people say, you know, how do I get through when someone I love has died? And I found, I spoke to Matthew Rutan, and when his dad died, he gave these, and I always say die, they don't say passed on and, and teach his own, but I just want to use the language people die. And he said, this, these are the cards he gave out at his dad's funeral be the evidence that someone's life made a difference. Isn't that extraordinary? I feel like that is so meaningful because truthfully we don't honor those who have died that we loved by no longer living ourselves. And I've met many people who just stay in their grief and never find joy again. And I think making it, being the, the um, evidence that someone's life made a difference is an extraordinary way that we can honor love we've shared with people. Now here's another thing, and yes, Peter talked about this, and I know there's a workshop about this, and if we want to be a part of that village, if we want to be able to just show up for our loved ones that need us and, and everyone, what is our most important job? What do we need to do first? Anybody? Self-care. My goodness. I have talked to so many people, and they say, your husband's dying, what is your most important job? And the big list, and she's dragging herself. She says, well, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to get, I said, no, that's not your most important job. Oh, well, sorry, I need to do this for him and this. I said, no, that's not your most important job. Your most important job, if you truly want to be a great caregiver, or, and, and you've heard this, right? And it's almost, oh, yes, I know, self-care, 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 it's a buzzword. But here's the thing, and I will tell you right now, if you are not a great self-caregiver, you are actually being selfish. It's like, what? I'm the most giving person in the world. What do you mean I'm selfish? If you are not a wonderful self-caregiver and you have a lot of caregiving to do, you will break down eventually, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, or financially. How do I know? Ask me how many stories I've seen of this in 30 years of nursing. More than I can count. Because your greatest gift is the very best version of you, right? And Peter talked about this yesterday. You can't go down if you're a caregiver. You have to be your number one priority. 
And that's, we don't celebrate self-care in this um, society either. I went to a conference and there were these women and it's like, how busy are you? Oh my God, look, I'm the busiest person in the world. I do everything for everybody else and nothing for me. And I just drag myself along. And then the next woman said, well, I worked 150 hours this week and I only had a crouton for breakfast. And like, I drove everyone's children everywhere and I did everything for everybody. And this just kept going. And then this one, the fourth woman, it's like, she said, oh, I don't even know want to say what I did. I thought, oh my god, what did you like save a continent? Like, you know, I'm so busy and stressed and they keep talking to each other. But she said, I had a massage yesterday. <laughs> and she was apologizing. Right? She, and everyone's like, oh, it must be nice to have all that time. Isn't that sad that we don't say good for you? Good for you. You need that. We need to celebrate self-care, like truthfully, I promise you, I can tell you all the stories. We can take all day of all the stories I've seen of people breaking down. But let's create a culture of change because here's the other thing. When we are not great self-care givers, we're very poor examples to our children and to other people, right? We're being very poor examples. And I don't think that there's anyone that needs care that looks at you falling apart, dragging yourself around, that's gonna feel good about that. So takeaway number four, Show up for yourself first. This is critical in life, to live life to the fullest. It is critical for everyone. And here's part of showing up for yourself first. Oh my goodness, let, let it just get rid of the whole conversation. Hi, Joe, how are you? Oh, I'm okay, thanks. Oh, well, you know, if there's anything you need, just let me know. Oh, okay, thanks. Oh, they're really holding up great, aren't they? You know what? Someone asks me how I'm doing and I'm not having a good, good time. It's like, no, actually, I'm falling apart, thank you. And then you get that look like, oh, they didn't really want the truth. Oh, well, is there anything I could do? <laughs> Heck, yes, there is. I have this list right here. <laughs> these are all the things I need the shoveling, the hose. I need all these things done. If you could just initial decide what you need to do. <laughs> Sorry. I'm over it. I'm over being the superhero that doesn't need help. You know, we need to stop complaining about the same thing over and over unless we're going to do something about it. People say, I'm, I'm stressed, I'm tired, I, don't, I can't manage. Well, what are you doing to change that? We have to. We need to reach out. We need to do something. Start asking, what do I need? Am I happy? Check in with yourself. Because the things that make me happy are going to have a five-minute walk sometimes in nature. Five minutes. That can change my entire day. I stand there like Mother Nature, and I just feel rejuvenated. And here's the other important thing we need to address before end of life arrives. What do you believe about end of life? What, what do you believe about life and death? And choose something to believe that creates a soft landing for you, right? I believe we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So then our spirit will just carry on, you know, this is just a temporary long one. And uh, it has its flaws, has, but you know, this is, this is what we get. There are no returns, darn it. It'd be nice sometimes. And you know, we share this with our children, actually. Our children, we have 24, 13, and 13. Twins at 40, thank you. Hold that off. <laughs> <laughs> but their twins are part, David and Jen are part of this journey, and they get this. And they're like, yeah, yeah, mom, I know when you die, you're gonna be a spirit, we'll stay connected, you can live in my heart. I know, I know, none of us know how long we're here, I get it. Look, I'm glad you get it, actually. I'm really glad you get it. They're so comfortable with it. Jaden actually went up to my mom when she was doing all of her trinket things, and she says, oh, Grandma, so when you go to hospice, can I have this? <laughs> it's a little too comfortable, but anyways. <laughs> and we've also taught our children different things make people feel better, right? We are not all the same. We are very different. When we're grieving, what makes us feel better? So we have all created self-care toolboxes. I so wanted to bring mine, it would not fit on the plane. But uh, we are different, and what makes me feel better? My goodness, so different than this man, Jordy, who's a paramedic, very compassionate. I have seen this man cry in 16 years, probably, <clears throat> I don't know, five times, right? At first I thought, man, he's made of stone. He has no soul. What's wrong with him? He grieves differently, right? And I understand that now because I, I, I studied and I, I educated myself. Jordy, just how many times would you say you've heard me cry or seen me cry? 
This week or? one other person cried in the audience and myself. But you know what? I don't apologize for that because I'm not afraid to show my humanness. But we all grieve differently, don't we? Our son Tanner said, Tanner, when you're grieving, go to your self-care toolbox. What makes you feel better? He's got Jim Carrey movies in there and his Lego. He's like, these are the things that make me feel better. Jake is very soulful. Chicken soup for the soul and crafts and, you know, things to go to. And Jordy, while he has, you know, dirty old fishing box that has like the keys to the garage and some duct tape and very few things in there. And when he's having a hard time, you can find him in the garage or outside chopping kindling. And that's going to make him feel better. And I will tell you, on my hardest, best, or worst day, chopping kindling is never going to be my go-to thing <laughs> in my entire life. So I have my beautiful self-care toolbox that has trinkets that that patients have given me from the chemo clinic and things that my children have given me and just to just feed my soul as I go along. And one of the most important things I have in my self-care toolbox is my tambourine. My tambourine is to remind me I am in charge of my own happiness. I'm in charge to make, of making my own music my own coping skills and strategies. It is nobody else's job on this earth to make me happy. And that's what that reminds me of. Why? Because I've been on many stages playing the tambourine. Not invited. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's just great. It's like, oh my god, they have a tambourine. And I'm like, oh god, there's Yvonne. Just spotted the tambourine. Here she comes. So takeaway number five. And I love this one. Do you know this couple? A couple of them have been married for, you know, 40, 50, 60 years. And the husband or the wife becomes ill, or she dies, and the husband's never made a sandwich. Anybody know that couple? This is where people stop making uh, eye contact. Oh, wow, you're that couple. <laughs> you know, it's not always possible, but that both can. But what about the the husband becomes ill or he dies, and the wife's never paid a bill? Right? We all know those couples. And the sad thing is that young people are still doing this to themselves in different ways. You have your jobs, you have your jobs, and that's all great in the house. But you know, if that person, or they, they go with the self-care thing, said, I'm doing some self-care, I'm going away for a month. We need to know how to do each other's jobs. There are different people in the house who ever can. We cannot. To make our children dependent is not a great thing. Because someday you will not be there, whether you're even awake. So Jordy works 12-hour shifts, and so he means he's gone for 14 hours because he works an hour away. That's uh, Muskoka last week. Yeah, I'm just kidding, it's not that bad yet. I don't think, I don't know, it could be. But I realized that I lived in this house, which is out in the forest, and the power used to go out a lot. I didn't know how to operate the generator. I had no idea. How ridiculous that I couldn't operate the generator that could power the whole house while he's gone for 14 hours. It's like, oh, I should be the damsel in distress. Oh, no, this one comes home soon so we can have power. <laughs> How ridiculous, right? And his first answer, yes, I know. At first he's like, oh, what did you say? Sorry, Journey. What could, what could I do in your way? Oh yeah, that was his first answer. I said, you know what, I don't even know how to operate this generator, so you can just call Jay. Oh, that's a great answer, isn't it? I don't even think so. Show me how to operate this stupid generator right now, because life is unpredictable, and change is the only constant. Someone said that. Change is the only constant in life. So let's prepare for anything. So let's wheel this thing out. Show me how to operate it. I mean, it has a choke, and it had different levers, and I just said, like, can I label the generator? <laughs> It's like, can you please not label the generator? Because then my friends will think I labeled it. <laughs> it no, it, please don't. So I got a piece of paper, I'm very visual. So, because you have to light the choke halfway, and then if you leave it for 10 seconds, halfway, this, this, all these levers, and they're boom. I got that thing running. I thought, oh my gosh, I feel so amazing. Because truthfully, how wonderful is it to be able to thrive in your own home? Do you know how many people I've said, I've spoken, and a lady says, my husband died, and I have no idea how to live in my house. I don't know where valves are, I don't know how to shut anything off. So I say takeaway number five. Structure your life in such a way that you are self-reliant, and so are the people surrounding you. Don't you think that that is a better way to live than have people, all our children, be dependent 
let's all do that. And sorry to everybody who now has to make a sandwich that was not to. <laughs> so takeaway number six, you know, it's all coming together. I felt good about it. Say, okay, we need to have talks before and let's diffuse that fear and get things out of the way. We need to be that village, show up for ourselves, um, or show up for others, just show up, show up for ourselves first, and be self-reliant. So I'm missing something. I need something more. So my mother-in-law said, why don't you go visit Minnie? She's like 101 years old. She's got to have some wisdom. And so I went to visit dear Minnie, who had just died a few months ago at the age of 105. And when I used to visit her, I'd say, Minnie, how are you doing? She said, oh, I'm still here. <laughs> like, what am I still doing here? I said, I don't know many, but you are, so let's visit. And we had many, she was so feisty, we had many wonderful visits, but I said, many. we don't talk about plan and prepare for grief, and certainly not for end of life, and I want to diffuse the fear, and I want to help people through this to be empowered and resilient. You must have some wisdom. You've been here for over 100 years. At first, she didn't think she really had a whole lot of wisdom, but I thought, no, I know you have something. So then she stood back and she said, you know, we all need a post, something that we can hang on to that can be there for us no matter what in times of despair. And I just kind of pause in, Minnie, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. She said, you're excited about a post? <laughs> I said, yes, I am. Because life is unpredictable and we need to prepare for anything and everything. And change is the only constant. Jobs change, health changes, relationships change, people move away. Right? Change is the only constant. So when the things that are going to make us, help us through, are things that are temporary, sometimes that doesn't, they're not there for us. Or if you have a grief attack at three in the morning, five years later, <coughs> maybe you have great friends, but maybe they don't want to chit chat at 3 a.m. I'm just saying, I don't want to. We need something that we can turn to that can be there for us, no matter what, no matter when. So for some people, that's a religion, spirituality, Yoga, nature, art, meditation, yoga in nature. Something that you can turn to that can be there for you no matter what. It connects you to something bigger than yourself that you can turn to anytime, anywhere. For me, it's nature. It truly is. When I go out in nature and I see, you know, the changing of the seasons, which we have beautifully in Muskoka, and I know that change is the only constant. So that means that my feelings of desperation or grief, because I've been, I've been in the deep trenches of grief, when I, I know that that's temporary too, I will not always feel this awful. And this reminds me that that will change too. It will morph into something different. So I say takeaway number six, find your post. Find your post. It's a beautiful picture of a post in San Diego, actually, and it's the water and everything, and that's just my visual, right? I need my post. Something to think about. Long before we are facing grief. You see my theme here? Before, before, before. So there's only one more takeaway, but this is where I kind of test to see if anyone's actually listening to me. <laughs> you didn't know there was going to be a test, did you? I just want to review the six takeaways. Takeaway number one, the best time to talk about plan and prepare for grief is when we are young and healthy. And the next best time is now. Stop procrastinating, the elephant's in the room, let's just do it. Takeaway number two, it takes a, it takes a village to support the ill, the caregiver, the dying, the bereaved, and each, and each other. We can do better. And we should do better. Takeaway number three, when you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say, just show up. Just show up with trouble in hand. Just show up. Takeaway number four, show up for yourself. First. Show up for yourself first. The greatest version of you is the best gift that you can give others. Takeaway number five, structure your life in such a way that you are self Heavier and massive, reliant, sufficient, yes, all of it, self-reliant. And so are the people surrounding you. And take wing number six, find your find your post and hold on to it. So takeaway number seven, I love because there's so many times that I have been at the bedside of dying people. I actually started to say, I wonder if I can speak to this. Do I have enough experience? So I started writing down names of people that I 
I've been involved in their dying process, and I stopped writing at 100. I thought that gave me some experience. But so many people, when they're at end of life, they say, oh my goodness, I have to think of my legacy. What's my legacy? I say, Joe, you're 95 years old. You've been crabby for 93 years. <laughs> That's your legacy. I'm sorry. Because your legacy is in what you create at end of life. Your legacy is what you create in each and every day, in each and every act of kindness. You smiled at someone or snarled at someone or you did a, a kind gesture, or just said hello or paid someone a compliment. Those are all wonderful parts of our legacy. Our legacy doesn't have to be grand things. I still talk about how extraordinary this teacher was when we were having our hardest day and she just came to our house and put a small pot of daffodils on my porch. To me, that's just a wonderful part of her legacy. You know, it, it, it's just, when you're in a room, are people happy that you were there? Or are they glad when you leave? <laughs> and if you're glad when I leave, could you just wait till I go and don't hear what you have to say? You create your legacy in each and every day. Each and every day. And you know, we can create wonderful legacies no matter how long we are on this earth. So takeaway number seven, what will your legacy be? So I hope my legacy will be that I was pretty funny and that I was silly and that I made a few people laugh in their darkest days because I have accompanied many people on their darkest day. I hope my legacy will be sharing my book because I have the honor of sharing so many other people's stories along the way and what an honor for me. And the I Just Showed Up movement because I believe that we can all learn and children know how to just show up and that's why you have those little bracelets in your spike. Whoops in your swag bags because just showing up is something that children are so great at and teens can be but you know they have to learn you know it's wonderful you can just show up for someone you don't have to do anything wonderful i asked five-year-old triplets about just showing up and they said i just showed up for my mom when papa died i just showed up for a new girl when she came to our school and she didn't know anybody I just showed up and I FaceTimed my dad when he was traveling and he was lonely. Just showing up. We can teach everybody. Imagine if we knew, everyone knew how to just show up. So our movement teaches people of all ages how to just show up for themselves and others so they are part of resilient and grief arrives. And I hope that you'll probably wear your bracelet and when people say, hey, what does that mean? Say, oh, well, good news. Just show up for me. It doesn't take much. I would love to see everyone everywhere have this bracelet. And we're in it together, aren't we? A Huntington Society, wow. See, that's where there's the Kleenex, because I knew I would make myself emotional. You know how to just show up. Extraordinarily. I've met incredible people here. Darn, I'm so close. And, uh, and there's so much caring that goes into this conference and for you to all come together. And we want to support you on your good days, on your bad days, and everything in between, because that's why we are here. And I'm just so completely honored to be here and to be a part of this journey with you. I don't have the answers, but I'm a really good hugger for those who like hugs. <laughs> I'm a great crier. And, you know, just willing to sit, be there, and sit in the mud with people on their hardest day. As if I can see that clock, right? Yes. Is it time for me to, what time is it? 10, 15? 10, 12. How much time do I have? How many? 15 minutes. So just showing up is so important. And you all showed up to this conference to learn, to support each other, and to be a part of something wonderful. And I just applaud you. And I have one call to action that I would like to share just at the end, but I'd love to take these few minutes. If anyone has a comment, a question, a story to share, anything at all. Where's that Sharon? Cheryl has something to say. Yes. Uh, just wondering. Oh, do you mind going to the mic, actually? That's what I was asked to tell people, to go to the mic so everyone can hear. Is it on? Yes. Uh, I've got a question about just showing up. Yes. Um, 
for me, I'm the person that just shows up all the time for my family, and the, the, the case for me is, and maybe you've seen this before, is when you're, you're just showing up and they're not even there anymore. Yes. And they're just alive. Mm -hmm. They're not actually yeah. really responsive, they're, they're not able to talk, um, but their bodies are for some forsaken reason still Keep there. Going. Yes. Their bodies are still there. And, yes. and so uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, yesterday after the conference, I scooted over to the care home and saw my dad, and I, I just showed up and I went and saw my grandpa. They're in the same care home. They hate each other. They're on different wings. It's quite funny. Well, that sounds like But <laughs> <laughs> I do. I go and see one and the other, and, and both of them are just kind of still there. Yes. Um, and just, just showing up. Do you have any advice for? Um, for when you when you are there talking to a body almost, um, what can you say? What can you do? You just show me a hi. I'm here again. Uh, you still yeah. don't care, but I'm here again. Anyway, you know, if they do right, you, you know, you hope it's hard to say. It's hard to say. It's really, it's really, it's hard to say because you don't know how far gone they're at. You don't know how stoned they are on their drugs right now. Yeah. You don't know a lot of things, and um, so just showing up in those circumstances, it's easy to lose. Uh, drive and determination to show up for them because there's no response and there's no response and how do you refuel yourself to keep showing up when there's just never any response? Good for you for acknowledging that because that is one of the hardest, hardest journeys. I've met many people who are supporting people in comas or whatever and they say, you know, science says that the hearing, hearing is the last thing that does go and the first thing you need to do is, are you great at showing up for yourself first? <laughs> okay, that's important because the other thing when I say just show up is sometimes we are just showing up for the support people around the person, right? Because there are others that are maybe supporting this person or going and showing up for the nursing staff and just being a part of that also because you, it's wonderful to get that, that feedback like, or, you know, I'm just showing up. so. Maybe just showing up for the nurses as well and saying thank you so much for doing this, and so you can get that and and really understanding what fuels you. Oh, did I do something? I might have. What fuels you? I lost my last thing. Sorry. Hey, you know I did something. Can you find my thing? Are you doing that? Hey, where's my last slide? <laughs> Showing up for yourself first and knowing whatever you are doing, you need to do with your self-preservation in mind. So if you go and you can only go for 15 minutes and knowing that person as well as you do or you know what used to mean something to that person, if you're there for 15 minutes and saying, hey dad, I'm just going to read you something I wrote. Hey dad, I'm just looking at some old pictures. These are things I remember. And knowing that you're doing the best that you can do and you don't really know but doing it in the chunks that allow you to say, I just showed up and that's the best that I can do and that has to be enough. Because we always admit that, that guilt, eh? Never feeling like, oh, I didn't do enough for them, I didn't do enough for them. Because you can't be there 24 hours a day and you don't know if you're reaching that person. So just doing the very best you can with the self-preservation and knowing I, I did everything that I could. There's always more you can do but I will tell you that I took care of a lady with Huntington's for two years and she never had one visitor. So whatever you're doing is good enough. And and refuel with other people that can say, good for you for being here. Right? And I now you're in my heart and we'll have to chat more about that. Seriously, but we can only do what we can do and we have to who's messing around with my slides? <laughs> can only do what we can do, right? That's a lot. That's a lot to people. But, yeah. And how wonderful that they like each other. <laughs> oh, okay. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, Yvonne. Hello. Ooh, ooh. This is a question via text message. The question is, how do you deal with anticipated grief and death? And how do you how do you manage the frustration of seeing the loved ones suffer and those thoughts of what Such a great question. And again, we have to be so incredibly great at self-care and understanding grief and as best as we can and how we grieve and having our self-care toolbox. 
the greatest thing and the only reason that I can do what I do without suffering excessively is that I have come to the acceptance of what life and death means to me and to not judge or try to understand why somebody else has a harder journey. Why, like, why someone has Huntington's. When I, when I took care of that lady, one of the nurses who did for two years, I suffered tremendously because I felt, oh my goodness, she doesn't have any real visitors and this is awful and why did this happen? And I just suffered tremendously, but then I wasn't the best version of myself. So we truly need to come to the place where everyone has their own journey and it's not up to me to decide what that journey should be. That person that you're anticipating and grieving what is to come, their journey is whatever it is, and they're here for however long they are, and we don't know why. And life isn't fair. That's the other thing, right? It isn't fair. We don't all get the same thing. Why does this person test positive and this one doesn't? I don't know. Of course it's not fair. But that is their journey for whatever reason. And you see, when, when I took care of that lady so many years ago, I thought, what could possibly how, how to, you know, here's this life and no one even visits. And I feel today I am honoring her and thanking her for everything that she taught me about how ill-prepared I was for grief. So we have to, if we can find that acceptance, of everyone has their journey and it's not up to us to fix it. We will suffer less. And it is hard, right? Acknowledging and allowing this is hard and allowing that grief along the way is the only way to get through. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear? Um, my name is Mark Huffman. I'm a neurologist in the Toronto area. And this really speaks to me to the grassroots of this organization. Um, and uh, Ariel Walker and I were just reminiscing. Back in about 1990, some people may have heard this story before, uh, I was just setting my practice. I moved to the Toronto area from Montreal, and Ralph Walker came to my office. Mm -hmm. Ariel was with him, but she was waiting for the car in the parking lot. Actually, I'm not quite sure. And Ralph's message was, you know what? We need healthcare professionals to deal with Huntington's disease. Uh, as a neurologist, the message in our, in our training was, put your efforts into things you can do to make a difference now. Um, that usually meant giving therapy or uh, changing things. And unfortunately, the Huntington's patients had fallen into through a crack because there wasn't anything to offer. And most of my colleagues across the country basically would say, yes, you have Huntington's, I can't do anything for you, go away. Ralph's message was very clear to me and had a major influence on my life. We need you to be there for patients. Just show up. Just show up. And that was his message, and that's really the grassroots of, uh, of this organization, which is spectacular and wonderful, and I think permeates to this day. So Ralph's memory is here. Oh, that's so extraordinary. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Because I, a doctor came up to me when I was whatever doing a presentation, and she said, "You know, I have to tell you that a patient came into my room or into the office, and she was grieving, and I looked at her, and I didn't know what to do or say, so I handed her a card for bereavement counselor." Oh my God! You know, just sit there and go. Oh, that sounds so hard. Tell me about that. In that moment, right? We can do better. And you know what? This message. I need a tribe to share this message because as much as I love to talk, I am only one person. I want a wonderful audience to be able to share this message with others everywhere, because we, you, are in the deep trenches of something very difficult, and we need to teach people. We need to teach community. Isn't that such a wonderful, positive thing that can come out of this? Teaching people how to just show up for themselves and others, and that it doesn't have to be a grand gesture to just show up. Oh, here comes my, here comes my. So may I just say my last piece? I promise that I'm done. Thank you so much for this honor. Here is my call to action for everyone here. Diagnosis, not diagnosis, healthcare, no matter who you are. Plan your life, plan your death, and then just love your life to death. And always bring your own tambourine to the party. Thank you.
fact, that just really resonated with everyone and talking about some very difficult and challenging scenarios and situations that so often we push down and don't want to think about. So thank you. Thank you so much. Can we hug? <laughs>